Okay, welcome everybody to the political economy workshop of UMass Amherst. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome Georgi Cicata and Nancy Folber. My name is Isabella Weber and it's a great pleasure to have you all here today. Georgi Cicata is research professor um, in development sociology and the director of the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana. Her research over many decades has spanned the areas of gender and development, women's movements and gender equality activism, politics and livelihood effects of land tenure reform, large scale land acquisitions and agricultural commercialization, informal labor relations and conditions of work. And among her many publications and important contributions is one um, book that I would like to highlight, which is Transatlantic Feminisms, Women and Studies in Africa and the Diaspora. I would also like to welcome Nancy Folber, whom I'm sure is familiar to many of you, since she's a professor emerita of economics um, at, the UMA, um, at the economics department at UMass, and also the director of the program on gender and care work at, here at Perry at the Political Economy Research Institute. And she's also a senior fellow of the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College, and her research explores the interface between political economy and feminist theory, with a particular emphasis on the value of unpaid care work. Nancy is the author of many, many books and articles, and her latest monograph is The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, which is forthcoming from Verso next year, and we can't wait um, to read it. Thank you so much, Georgie and um, Nancy, for joining us today. Um, it's it's um, a great pleasure to have you. And um, I'm looking forward to your two presentations of 25 minutes each on the important topic of the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic for the care sector in the global so South and the global North. And I think it's particularly um, exciting that we managed to get both of you into one room for today um, to um, bring together your two important yet different perspectives on this crucial topic. We will begin with Nancy. Um, so Nancy, the floor is yours. And as the presentations unfold, you are invited to use the chat um, to discuss amongst yourselves um, on any questions or comments that come up during the talk. Um, but there will also be a Q&A session of 40 minutes where you'll all have a chance to address questions directly to the speakers. Without further ado, Nancy, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Isabella. I uh, really appreciate all the work that has gone into this um, political economy seminar. And I'm really looking forward to the chance to have some back and forth about these issues. Let me just share my screen. Um, the um, topic of my talk is implications for the care sector in the US. And I wanna start by explaining what I mean by the care sector. It's not part of the standard textbook uh, vocabulary. And in a way, I think it's a concept that's come to the fore uh, during the, the pandemic. So what I mean by the care sector is both paid and unpaid work that involves personal interaction and often emotional attachment. And it's also work where motivation plays a really important role because concern for the well-being of the care recipient is likely to affect the quality of the services that are provided. And uh, it, the care sector has a unique product uh, or outcome. It, it is very much focused on the development of human capabilities, health, education, social services, and women are heavily concentrated in uh, these industries within the United States. And this concentration also shows up if you look at essential workers, a category somewhat vaguely defined by the Department of Homeland Security, but, but interesting uh, nonetheless. So, um, about half of all essential full-time paid jobs are in care services. And of those about three fourths of all essential paid care workers um, are women. And these paid care workers are in general getting paid less than uh, their counterparts in other parts of the economy with the same level of, of education and other uh, personal characteristics. 
So what the pandemic has done is it's, it, it's uh, imposed a huge price shock on the care sector. And it's a price shock that doesn't show up in the consumer price index um, or other kind of uh, typical measures uh, because it includes a shock to unpaid care as well as uh, the cost of paid services. So every single job that involves physical or social contact is now uh, both riskier and, and more expensive, partly because of the needs of mit to, you know, the need to mitigate risk. And health risks are particularly high in healthcare, in elder care, and in education. And in addition to increased cost, there's been a reduced supply of paid care services, especially school and childcare closing has had a very big effect on um, households, especially households with young children. And even services that um, don't involve direct care are, are more costly in terms of the time that it takes to actually get them done. And the pictures of people standing in line in the US to vote for hours and hours is a, is a really good indicator of that. But um, uh, you know, many other uh, typically routine activities like shopping have become more time consuming. So uh, you know, what we've seen is that um, the increased demands on unpaid care have been for the most part met by a very powerful shock absorber. And that shock absorber, absorber is basically families and in particular women and you could almost think of it in terms of a different concept of elasticity. And instead of price elasticity or income elasticity, which are the concepts that we focus on in an introductory mi microeconomics course, you think about high elasticity with respect to need. And that's because a lot of unpaid care is very strongly motivated by concern for the welfare of other people. And that's what makes it such a um, powerful uh, shock absorber, we would all be uh, a lot worse off were it not for the increased amount of unpaid work time that has uh, been provided to compensate for the uh, COVID um, impact. And I think what this has done, uh, or what our experience of, of this uh, buffer buffering effect has done is it's really helped redefine work. And I think, uh, uh, here in the U.S., we have a, a, a better appreciation of the meaning of work. And here, here's a here's a comment that I think is is really emblematic of this. Uh, I just want to share with you. I sent this out on Twitter um, a couple of weeks ago. Please stop saying parents can't work because of childcare school closure problems, and say instead parents can't earn money because taking care of kids is work and parents' workload has increased, not decreased. It's not that they can't work, they're, they're working longer hours than ever before, and those words matter. So uh, actually, uh, if as some of you who know me or know my work, I've been saying, I've been making this point for about 30 years uh, and not getting a lot of traction, but this one post on Twitter got about 280,000 engagements. It's the only thing I've ever uh, gone viral with. And I take that as a sign of um, a real change in the way that people are thinking about um, the word work. And there's also been, I think, a pretty widespread recognition of the um, gendered impacts uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's referred to as a she session. Uh, in the past, recessions have affected, in the, in the US at least, have tended to have a particularly severe effect on men because men are more concentrated in cyclical industries. But because the service sector has borne the brunt of the adjustments um, that we've had to make, um, that, that's a factor that's exacerbated the uh, gendered impact. So women's unpaid workload has increased uh, more than men's even though men's has also increased. And there are several household surveys uh, that are documenting, have documented uh, this shift. Women have reduced their paid work hours more than men. They did so almost immediately in the first months of, of the pandemic. More women than men have dropped out of the paid labor force uh, in, uh, 
August and September, four times as many women as men dropped out of the paid labor force. So that's what I mean by this. That, that's a pretty big elasticity. Um, uh, more women than men have experienced unemployment and uh, all of these negative effects have been greater for black, Hispanic, less educated workers uh, in general. So um, really important to think about, look at, consider all of the dimensions of the uh, uh, distribution of the impact. So um, I think also what the pandemic has, has revealed is a, a pretty big set of institutional malfunctions. And I think, you know, there's a really distinct pattern. It's not just lack of leadership or uh, the political party in power. Um, we've seen pretty serious malfunctions in healthcare, elder care, childcare, and education. And I feel like I don't really need to belabor these, but, but um, a lot of these problems have to do with the difficulty of uh, adjusting, uh, uh, of relying on market forces or relying on uh, local government rather than a national plan uh, to coordinate care. Um, in some cases they have to do with the, I mean, in fact, in all these cases, they have to do with the fact that these sectors combine private and public uh, provision in ways uh, that often bring out the worst of both worlds instead of the, the best of both worlds. Nursing homes are a really good example. Uh, uh, for years, researchers have been pointing out that um, there's just a generic problem with inadequate funding and poor regulation. And that really, um, that, that, that set things up for a really serious um, health impact and high mortality in, in nursing homes in, in the US. Uh, Childcare in the short run, lack of access, workers not being able to get it. And the long run uh, concerns about the supply, long run supply of childcare because a lot of childcare centers are small businesses that cannot basically weather uh, the economic dislocation they're experiencing. Even the Wall Street Journal has been you know, surveys of manufacturing employers have pointed to this as a potentially uh, serious problem. And of course, we're all living through the problems in education with very uneven policies, disrupted schedules. You know, it's great that we have new technologies, it's costly to adapt to them. And in areas, many areas of the US, the digital divide is making it really hard. Uh, for students in, in some communities uh, to effectively move to online education. And that is also a, a very telling aspect of institutional malfunction. I think we should stop talking about the gender gap and start talking about the gender chasm. Um, if Biden wins um, the national election, I think we'll, you'll have to thank women. And it's not just about misogyny. It's not just about um, sexual harassment, although I'm, I'm certain that's a part of it, it is very much related to a gendered reaction to the pandemic. So a lot of figures have been thrown around, but uh, a recent poll shows that among like, likely voters, women are favoring Biden 59% to 36%. This is, this is an unprecedented uh, difference. And men are pretty evenly split between uh, Trump and Biden at 48%. I, also, if you look at trends over time, defection from support for Trump was much greater among women uh, than among men. So that is suggestive of the effects of the pandemic. But there's also survey evidence from eight countries. Um, this is not unique to the US. Women are more likely than men to perceive the pandemic as a very serious health problem and to agree and comply with restraining measures. So the difference is not huge. It's six to eight percentage points. But um, when you when you take into account that uh, men are actually at much higher risk of mortality, I think uh, it, it's, it's very telling. But of course, it's not surprising because most women are to some extent or another kind of in the care business and uh, they, uh, they care about uh, care outcomes. So I think that um, really the most important lesson here is a very general one that we need to rethink what we mean when we say the economy um, and really bring uh, the care se sector more closely in, into focus. So we need to be really challenging aggregate measures like gross domestic product or stock market indices uh, that are really directly misleading. We need to really highlight uh, the negative impact of market forces in the care sector. This is the area of the economy where market forces are most likely to have 
some uh, really negative uh, consequences. We need to be making the point that better social provision of care services would benefit everyone. And also, I think we need to alert people and raise awareness of the extent of distributional conflict over the cost of care provision. And this is a, a, a form of conflict that's really complicated. It's shaped by gender, by race, ethnicity, by class and citizenship. And it also has really uh, uh, international uh, dimensions. And I think it's very important for heterodox economists committed to political economy to particularly um, e emphasize this kind of intersectional uh, complexity of collective conflict. So I just want to end with some uh, a few mentions of specific policy issues that are, have, have come to the fore and point to some really interesting research. Catherine Moose has a um, paper forthcoming in feminist economics, class struggle. It's, it's about class struggle over the cost of social reproduction, uh, also brings in an intersectional analysis and looks very specifically at the fiscal impact of US recovery legislation in 2020. So I think it, it's a really interesting feminist public finance, political economy um, hybrid. Uh, Medicare for all provides more for less. Jeanette Wickslim, among the many uh, economists here at UMass who are tirelessly <laughs> um, pushing for healthcare reform. Jeanette has a, a really good piece in the current Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. Job creation strategies, really important and really need to uh, come to the fore uh, in, in the months to come. Lenore Palladino has a great article forthcoming in Feminist Economics, Public Investment in Home Healthcare in the US during the COVID-19 pandemic, a win-win strategy. So some really good numbers, just this is just what, you know, how many uh, really decent jobs we could create uh, with enormous social value by uh, investing more heavily in um, public support for home health care. And <clears throat> excuse me, I've been working with um, a couple of graduate students on pay and protections for essential workers, looking at uh, comparisons between workers in the US, Germany, and Canada. That paper is called uh, Cheap Praise. Um, you know, there's been a lot more banging of pots and pans and clapping hands than provision of, of supplemental pay. Uh, there's also a really, um, really excellent issue of the American Prospect that just came out, a special issue on care policies. And uh, I, I share the URL with you here so that you can, um, uh, you can access it. There's also a really good video with a lot of the uh, participants in that special issue kind of laying out their own personal um, take on it. I think really good for classroom use. So uh, just, I really wanted to highlight it. And then finally, a couple of un upcoming seminars, um, and I'm sure there are many others. I just wanted to mention these two, one that the International Association for Feminist Economics is, is sponsoring um, on October 28th, and another that the Care Work Network and the Southern Gerontological Association are sponsoring on November 2nd. And uh, I, I'm just hoping that we can use this uh, uh, seminar today as kind of a way to uh, do some better networking about uh, these events. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your attention and I'm really looking forward to the, the discussion. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, let's jump right over to Jyoti and uh, I will share your presentation. Um, thank you. Good evening and, and good afternoon and good morning, wherever you, you might find yourself um, today. Thanks to Isabella and the organizers of this uh, webinar for inviting me to join this uh, conversation. Uh, it's, I'm especially honored to share the platform with Nancy Foba, from whose work I've learned a lot about how to think about households and, and the care economy. Um, I have a caveat as my start. 25 minutes is a really short time to talk about the global South, except in very in indicative terms, so to, to take my presentation um, as such. Part of the challenge, as you know, is that the countries of the global South, which consists of Africa, most of um, the Middle East, many parts of Asia, the Pacific, Latin America, and the Caribbean, 
do have some similarities in terms of income per capita, poverty levels, the relative size of their informal subsistence and care economies, and the size of the agrarian extractive and service sectors. However, their variations are also immense. The Global South includes China, probably the largest economy in the world today, as well as other large economies such as India, Brazil, small economies, fragile island nations of the Caribbean, many dry land, landlocked LDCs in Africa and so on. There's also the problem of the South in the North and less talked about, but also very pertinent, the North in the South. Take the example of the unfolding food crisis for poor families in the UK at this time. According to the footballer, Marcus Rashford, who is campaigning for an expansion of free school meals for, to all under 16 children whose parents are in universal credit and to provide meals and activities during school holidays. 14% of parents and 10% of children in the UK have experienced food insecurity over the last six months. And the demand for food banks this winter is predicted to be 61% higher than it was last year. It is therefore not surprising that close to 1 million people in the UK have signed this petition to date, and over 2,000 pediatricians in the UK have written a letter to the government supporting the petition. It is thought that 1.4 million children were eligible for free school meals, a figure expected to have increased during the pandemic. The Afri that the African American communities in the US are also some of the hardest hit by the COVID crisis is another example of the grave gaps in vulnerability and suffering amidst plenty within countries and regions of the global north. With these caveats in mind, I want to make five points which focus on, on the global south. And the first is that COVID is complicated in the way it's been disruptive but also in the way it's reinforced um, certain pre-existing characteristics. So although the global character of the COVID-19 pandemic means that few wherever they find themselves have been left untouched by its unprecedented character and the threats it represents to what's taken for granted about how the world works, both short-term and long-term responses to COVID and COVID effects are highly differentiated. There are significant differences within and among countries, regions, and continents regarding its health burdens, its disruptive effects, and socioeconomic implications. Much worse, it has been challenging to fashion responses, given that the there's a level of uncertainty about the trajectories of the virus. For example, while Europe is in the throes of a second wave, the US appears to be still within its first wave, and there's uncertainty about whether and with what severity Africa and Asia will experience a second wave. One thing we've learned from COVID though is that it's, dis it's, it's, it's disruptive, but at the same time, it reinforces underlying and pre-existing conditions for individuals, for communities, for countries, for regions and continents. So it has exposed the deficits and fault lines in the care economies around the world, particularly in the global South with its high levels of informality and self-employment and its weak formal care systems in sectors such as education, health, housing, infrastructure, and social policy. COVID is wreaking havoc and increasing the care burdens of households without the requisite support to address these burdens. Countries in parts of the global south, particularly Africa, may not be carrying the heaviest burdens of infections and mercifully so. There are on average only 103 hospital beds per 100,000 inhabitants in LDCs. And this is less than half the number in other developing countries and around 80% below developed countries. However, in the short term, we have seen that the anticipated medium and long-term effects of COVID-19 on economies and societies will certainly be, be, will be more harshly felt in the global south. And this is predicted to deepen poverty and inequalities. So whilst um, the World Bank predicted that the global economy would shrink by 5.2% and that Africa would contract by 2.8%, it's important for us to understand that for developing economies, it is not the size of the shrinkage, but how it sets back the progress that has been made in poverty reduction and in social development and how it reinforces the precarious character of employment 
in the global workplace. Next slide, please. My second message, my second point is that lockdown measures have raised red flags about livelihoods. They remind us about the importance of the home for well-being while drawing attention to unacceptable housing deficits and pre-existing inequalities. Measures such as lockdown and the closing of workplaces, educational institutions, places of leisure and social engagements have been debated between finance and and, and health and social development officials across the globe in terms of trade-offs, trade-offs between life and health on one side and livelihoods on the, on the other side. Um, the responses of the streets have shown us that these trade-offs are not um, as sharp as we, we, we imagine them to be. Um, all across Africa, several in several low-income communities, people have said that they would prefer to, uh, to, to catch COVID rather than die of, of, of hunger. So lockdown and social distances, social distancing maybe have become global phenomena, but they mean very different things and are experienced differently in different contexts. First of all, the severity of lockdown is really a continuum across the global South from the total lockdowns of provinces and whole countries to partial lockdowns and to no lockdown at all. Secondly, how a lockdown is experienced in an overcrowded shanty town, whether in Accra, Lagos, Cairo, Rio, or Jakarta, where home is one room shared by many persons, is different from the experiences in the suburbs and middle class neighborhoods of these same cities and in the global north. Social distancing in an open air market in many parts of the global south is a different proposition from the social distancing measures of supermarket chains around the world. How do populations dominated by self-employment and, and workers who live from hand to mouth and who are sometimes too poor to even cook their own meals, preferring instead to buy meals from the roadside food vendors, how are they to survive in lockdown? It is arguable that the failure to domesticate COVID-19 containment policies is what has destroyed the lives and livelihoods in the global South. With respect to care, lockdown and social distancing rules have underlined the importance of social reproduction and its many spaces, the home, living spaces, food markets, as well as key institutions, the educational, health, housing, and employment, and other social institutions. There's wide agreement in the literature and, and Nancy's presentation shows this, that lockdown has exposed and worsened the heavy burdens of unpaid care and domestic work of women and girls. This is a neglected policy issue made even more problematic by the dominance of patriarchal ideologies that have rendered the home care and domestic work invisible, naturalized and sanitized. With the lockdown and on ongoing closure, of schools and institutions of e-learning and with many workers working from home or on leave or retrenched, people are spending much more time at home in, house, in housing which has not been built for such intensive use. This has exposed the problem of the housing sector. The quantitative and qualitative housing deficits in many parts of the global south have been the subject of concern, particularly in the slums of the mega cities of the global south. The overcrowded conditions, the sharing of sanitation facilities by multiple households, the lack of running water within homes, the extensive use of charcoal and fuel wood are for cooking, and the problem of poor sanitation and ventilation are only some of the few problems of, of housing and housing facilities. With children at home, there has been an expansion in women's roles as homeschoolers and education supervisors in countries and continents with some of the youngest populations of, on, this, on this planet and the least schooled mothers. These new tasks and the high expenditures on food have become a headache for women, many of whom are also fashionable livelihoods, mitigate the disruptions of work in the service sector, such as the beauty industry, the dressmaking, industry and, 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 and domestic work. Education is also under the spotlight in the global south, just as Nancy has signaled with, with, with her presentation. There are concerns that 
this could be an area of expanding inequalities in access to and, the, and quality of education. Students, particularly those from rural areas, from poor urban families and girls are the most likely to drop out of school because of their lack of access to e-learning technologies, loss of interest and momentum, and loss of peer support, parental income deficits, and teenage pregnancy. The massive loss of in employment and the expansion in precarious work and poverty are deepening the subsidies that the care economy has had to provide to ensure the reproduction of current and future workers. Lockdown and its frustrations has also resulted in reported increases in intra-household tensions and gender-based violence. Regarding health, there's a real risk that with the increased spending on COVID treatment facilities, health spending on reproductive health and related services will be sacrificed with its attendant negative impacts on maternal and under five mortality and morbidity. Already many countries have recorded substantial reductions in hospital attendance, a troubling situation for countries with high maternal mortality rates and poor reproductive health indicators. Also pertinent are the expected rise in women's care burdens, which are linked to the fact that many frontline health workers are women. Next slide, please. My third point is that COVID-19 has reminded us of the fragility of food systems in the global South. The World Food Program suggests that the number of people facing food crisis will likely double due to COVID-19. A combination of disrupted markets, lack of international trade, reduced travel, and mobility, of rest and mobility restrictions are impacting people's ability to grow, to buy, to sell, or prepare the food they need to stay healthy. By the end of 2020, the USAID argues that 265 million people are likely to face starvation. In many parts of the global South, the dependence on food imports and the lack of investments in local food production had already created and reinforced food security deficits and volatility in food prices. Women's heavy participation in food production, processing, trade, and their responsibility for household nutrition has put them on the front line of the COVID-19 induced food crisis, which has come on the heels of the 208 global food crisis from which many regions are yet to recover fully. Recent studies in Southern Africa have shown that um, COVID-19 and the measures to contain it are already having a negative and gender differentiated impact on all dimensions of food security and nutrition through reduced food production and distribution capacities, decreasing purchasing power and diminishing access to nutrition. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I wanted to show that diagram. Okay, so um, th um, th 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 this diagram is, is, is from the high level panel on, 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 on food security, which um, is showing us the ways in which uh, COVID-19 has been disruptive of, of food systems and is creating uh, food, food in insecurities. And whilst this is a global phenomenon, um, the, 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 the fragilities of the food systems in, the globe, in many global South countries suggest that the global South is going to be a uh, hardest hit. Next slide, please. My fourth point has to do with the care economies. And here I want to reiterate a point and, and Nancy made about the care economies of the global north, that in the global south as well, care economies have been subsidizing extractivist capitalism for too long and decades of neoliberal social policy has stretched them to crisis point. One clear difference between the global north and south is the relative sizes of their subsistence and unpaid care economies. This at once speaks to the fragilities of care, the care economy and its resilience and ability um, to, 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 um, to um, self-exploit and also exploit the labor of the women and girls who dominate this space. As has been observed by feminists for a long time, women's unpaid and unrecognized reproductive work is a critical subsidy for capitalist accumulation and the reproduction of labor. This work, which is secured by patriarchal normative power, has become even more critical for coping with the fallouts from COVID-19. The limitations of neoliberal social policy have compounded this problem. 
In the last five decades, social policy has shifted from being an integral aspect of the developmentalist agenda to becoming a residual category anchored within a neoliberal market-driven paradigm. This is manifest in the current sole focus of social policy on social protection, which is largely designed to deal with the fallouts of market-driven policies. Several commentators have drawn attention to this problem, which has several aspects. The state has largely withdrawn from direct provision of public goods and services, leaving these to be managed through market mechanisms. This has resulted in a shift from universalism to targeting as a fundamental principle of social policy. Increasingly, social policy consists of fragmented and segmented measures targeted as a deserving poor who can only benefit after passing means tests. It has resulted in the homogenization of social policy across the global South, mainly as cash transfers, health insurance, and meals for children in school. The productivist orientation of social policy, however, remains dominant. It perpetuates the view that social policy measures are handouts instead of investments in certain development outcomes. Even more fundamental is that the challenge of social reproduction and the care economy remains off the agenda of social policies. From a gender perspective, social policy, no matter how broadly conceived or progressive, has not centered the production of the problem of gender inequality. Although social protection measures such as cash transfers, fee exemptions for pregnant women and credit programs have supported women's welfare and have acceptance among women facing existential challenges. They have also reinforced or ignored gender inequalities in failing to address the costs of care and domestic work in terms of recognition and compensation, investments in improved services and infrastructure and technologies for care and domestic work and the promotion of a more equitable gender division of care and domestic work. Women for their part have had to compromise gender equality principles and assume normative expectations of filial, maternal and mar marital piety and selflessness and hard work to qualify for support. They often have to accept extra work, group work, intrusive institutional policing, while gender equality goals fall by the wayside or assumed to flow from welfare and social welfare interventions. Next slide, please. My last point, point five, is that COVID responses will deepen structural inequalities and poverty unless there's a fundamental rethink of policies targeting households, businesses, and the general public. One of the responses to COVID-19 has been a return to some policy instruments that had been jettisoned in the neoliberal turn. This would have been a positive development if these were fully cognizant of the current conditions of working people in the global South. Measures such as water and electricity subsidies for all, for, for all households and, and, and tax rebates for frontline workers were structured in ways that res, res, resulted in the poorest households being excluded from accessing these benefits. Since these subsidies were provided to people at the point of payment for water and electricity. Households without metered running water and electricity at home could not claim these benefits. These constituted the majority of households in a country such as Ghana. Income tax exemptions for, for frontline workers do not recognize frontline workers to include self-employed sanitary workers, food traders, and food producers. The question of how to extend social policy measures and and household and business support measures to self-employed, informal, rural and urban frontline workers and micro-enterprises is something we need to put on, on, on the table. In conclusion, I'd like to say, next slide please. We do live in an interconnected world and that recognition is more important now than ever. However, we make our way, the way we, we make our way and it depends on structural factors that make a difference to outcomes for people, countries and regions. COVID has, had, has exposed the integral links between North and South, while also showing us ways in which pre-existing conditions in the global South have shaped the effects of COVID-19 and government responses. This points to the need to continue to struggle for a rethink of economic and social policies 
in ways that promotes the transformation of the global south and the lives of its poorest citizens, particularly those without, without whom the invisible and untiring work um, of care would not be possible and many communities and households would not survive. I thank you. Thank you so much, Jochi, and thank you so much, Nancy. I think those two presentations really made the centrality of gender and care absolutely clear in this current crisis. And also, I think the framing of yours, Jochi, of talking about disruptions and reinforcement at the same time works really well when we try to think together um, the impacts in the global north and the global south. Thank you so much. Um, we now move on to the Q&A um, part of this workshop. Um, I see that some of you have already posted questions in the chat. Um, I would like to ask you to please, nevertheless, um, post stack into the chat in case you have already posted a question because we won't be able to go through the whole chat again. So if you have a question, please post stack in the chat and I will then call on you um, and you will have a chance to directly address your question to Nancy and Georgi. Okay, um, so I see Jayati has a question. And Sam Bowles also has a question, I think. Okay, um, so Jayati and then Sam, please. Thank you so much. These were absolutely terrific presentations and I think both of you summarized the issues so well. Uh, coming from these, one thing that strikes me is uh, you know, Georgie, you highlighted this whole issue of the kinds of other sort of what Nancy has described as extended care activities, which are so important in developing countries like fetching water and storing water and so on. And uh, how these are particularly important in a health crisis. These have become more difficult, more demanding and uh, yet less considered in policy. So even in the developing world, we're saying, oh, do so-called social distance, physical distancing, we're saying wash your hands frequently, et cetera, without any reference to the impossibility of doing that actually, given the constraints that many poor households face and the burden that it places on women. So one is about how all of these extended care activities that Nancy has highlighted and you identified in, in your talk as well, how we bring that into much more the forefront of policy. And the second is just a, it's a surprise to, I think, all of us how the recognition of the urgency and essentiality of care work has not translated into any policies that actually reward and remunerate care workers. And frontline care workers in particular, in uh, many of our countries, as you mentioned, uh, Georgie, but also some of them are not even recognized, but even the ones who are recognized often tend to be voluntary workers, as they're so-called, or uh, you know, not formal workers, in, even in the public sector, uh, with very, very low wages, typically below minimum wages, because they're not recognized as public employees, and have faced even more discrimination during the pandemic because of the fear that they carry infection. So what is the political economy of this, that societies, despite recognizing the significance of care work, are simply still unwilling to reward or remunerate or is, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Judy, you want to take that first or you want me to chime in? Nancy, you can go first. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I think that's a great question and it's a really tough one. Um, I think I would refer back to what I was describing as uh, uh, some distributional conflict over the distribution of the costs of caring for other people. And on, on the one hand, you know, and this is actually kind of an answer to Sam's question as well. On the one hand, the pandemic has made us appreciate our interconnectedness and our common vulnerabilities. And it's really illustrated the concept of externality in a, like a really powerful way. But it's also really frightened. I think that that acknowledgement, uh, that evidence really frightens people. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, very, it's very threatening, the thought that they might have to take some responsibility for thinking about other people um, is, is very frightening and it elicits a big backlash. And I think we're, 
you know, we're kind of at an inflection point where we don't really know um, uh, what the net political effect is going to be. But I'm actually pretty opt optimistic that the sheer weight uh, of this uh, shock is going to create some momentum for for changes in policies, and I think the the gender chasm that I referred to uh, before is kind of is is evidence of that. So um, I may be too hopeful. Jati, would you also like to respond? Yes, please, and th thank you, uh, Jati, for 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 that. Um, for that question. Um, I, I, I think that part of the reason why it's easy to ignore care work, obviously, has to do with the people who, who do it and, um, and also the, the kind of work it, it, it is. Um, and I think Nancy described that well when she, when she talked about the fact that care is very particular. It takes, it takes um, um, certain qualities to do it well. And you usually people care for who, who they are caring uh, for. So, and that and all the normative um, and, and ideological factors around care work means that even when um, people are suffering from, from um, what they are giving to be able to do care work, they are not likely to, to, to stop. In the case of people who are doing um, um, paid care work, because many, many of them have to survive by doing this kind of work. And in the, in the global north, for example, many of these persons also are migrants who have all sorts of uncertainties and, 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 and are facing all sorts of challenges. I think um, the, the, the system keeps on reproducing itself and keeps on stretching itself. And I suppose as long as it, 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 it does not uh, give up, um, people will still pretend it does not uh, exist. And, and I don't have Nancy's optimism because I feel like this is not the first time the world is facing um, a, um, a crisis of this nature. I know we've never had a, 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 a COVID pandemic, but we've had crises and, and breakdowns. The, 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 the 208 crisis was an example when there was a lot said about the problematic nature of the world order, the, the the economic policies that are not working and the, 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 the neoliberal, uh, the end of, of the romance with neoliberal economics and so on. And somehow people went back to business as usual. And, and you already can see that occurring in, 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 in this period. So if I take the example of a place like Ghana, even as the government for the first time in many years is considering extending subsidies in education and in, 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 in electricity and, and, and water. Policymakers cannot be bothered to do it in a way that makes sure that the poorest of the, of, of the population are the ones who benefit from it. Instead, it is um, middle-class workers who, um, who live in the suburbs who have mainly enjoyed uh, these, these subsidies. So, um, there's a lot of ferment, and I feel that it is also linked with with this uh, with, with, with with the COVID crisis and 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 basically the 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 outcomes of COVID and the ways in which they've disorganized people. But I I'm not sure that th this is going to lead to any change. I think we can just continue <laughs> uh, organizing and 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 insisting and 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 analyzing this this problem. And um, change is slow, it takes time. So hopefully uh, we, we will get to change, change one day. Thank you so much, Jayati, for your question, Nancy and Georgie for your answers. Um, Sam Bowles is next in the list. Sam, are you there? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm here. Um, well, I think that, um, uh, I'm optimistic about the, some possibilities. They depend a lot on uh, how they're exploited. But one thing that seems pretty obvious to me is that COVID killed individualism and laissez-faire. I mean, it really, it wasn't doing very well after 2008. Uh, and it seems that it really now is on the defensive as long as people around the world mount a very coherent attack on it with a good alternative. I and mean, I, I just don't see how it's going to 
recover from this scope of a disaster. Um, I think that, you know, the idea that you can organize a society and it would be governed well on the basis of self-interest certainly is gone now. I mean, no one, no one believes that. I'm not sure if anybody really believed it before. It is just absolutely, it's, it's, it's a shocking statement to make. People make it, they're still powerful. I predict that people who continue making it will be easily um, displaced by other people, not necessarily progressive, but that's a set of conservative ideas that's going to have to be replaced by another set of conservative ideas. You know, conservatism in the past was not associated with individualism, for example, in laissez-faire. It was associated with all kinds of notions about tradition and, and, and um, race and, and uh, natural superiorities. Um, but in the, the other thing it seems to me that's coming out of this crisis is if, if, if one message is we can't organize society on the basis of self-interest, think of all the evidence that we're getting about how heroic people are, how much they're willing to take the concerns of others uh, to heart and really do something about it. And the, the last thing, which is not a source of optimism, is that among the other regarding views that seem to be promoted by this pandemic, tribalism is also one. Nationalism, uh, uh, sort of uh, labeling the other as somehow the vector of the disease, the most obvious attempt to do this is President Trump. But I, I, what I fear is it's going to be a battle to make sure that the other regarding preferences that are being supported by this pandemic take a uh, egalitarian and democratic form rather than a nationalist and um, exclusionist form. But I, but I, but I wonder if, um, you know, am I crazy to be so optimistic? I think it's a wonderful opportunity for progressive people to make a case for a fundamentally different way of understanding how the economy works and how we should govern our society. Thank you. Nancy and Jotty, would you like to respond? Yes, indeed. Um, I, 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 I like your optimism and I, and I think it's, um, it's well-founded. Um, th this is a time to want to, um, to push for, for, for new ideas. And indeed, we, see, we, we can link the COVID crisis indirectly to a number of, of struggles around the world which have um, really uh, taken off. So the Black Lives Matter movement and more recently the, the Nigerian Lives Matter movement, which is a movement led by young people, middle class and, 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 and working class young people working together to insist on accountability from the Nigerian state. Now, this is truly, um, truly, truly uh, powerful. I also have seen um, self-reliance, innovations. A lot of people in, in the global south are inventing things which, which would, um, would support uh, the fight against COVID and, 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 and so on. So why am I not as optimistic as you are? I, I guess it just has to do with the fact that um, we've seen these movements and they continue to knock on the door, they continue to make demands. And yet somehow it has been possible to co-opt these demands. And you find the same institutions which were uh, uh, leading the charge for neoliberalism, co-opting ideas and turning them around and, 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 and it continues to, to, to be uh, business as usual. We, we only have to ask ourselves who have benefited the most from this COVID crisis? Who, who is having a good COVID? It is, a, it is big pharma. <laughs> it is um, a large, a, a, a large businesses that happen to be in communications and so on. It is not. Um, it, it is not. Uh, the, 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 it, it, it is not the, the mass of people. It's not women. It's not those who are working in the informal economy and so on. And and as I've been saying about the global south, many governments can't even be bothered to domesticate advi health advisories such as social distancing and and and, and, and lockdown to suit uh, our, our conditions. So th that's the basis for 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 my lack of optimism. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm sorry I'm, I, I'm not optimistic because I do see um, the reasons why we should, we should keep on fighting and, 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 and I will happily join the fight, but I don't know what the outcomes are likely to be. Yeah. 
Thank you. Nancy, would you also like to respond? Well, just to second what Joji said, I, I think really doesn't really matter how optimistic or how pessimistic we are. And I know I personally am on sort of a pretzel roller coaster uh, in that dimension. Uh, I don't think we can let it affect our resolve to try to take advantage uh, politically of, of what's going on to change the way we view the world. I agree with Sam that nationalism is really a, a, a serious threat. And I think we've already seen that emerging. I think also kind of the digital economy is also a kind of a, a counterweight. That is um, now the high tech sector is saying, oh, well, we can solve this problem with artificial intelligence and we can have robots take over care and they won't get infected. And, you know, that'll be so much more efficient. And, and oh, yes, yeah, some people will lose their jobs, but, uh, you know, we can find something for them to do, like taking care of our kids or cleaning out our closets. And a uh, like I've literally seen that argument being made online. So uh, in whatever, however we come down, we need to really look at uh, what the counter movements, counter threats might be. Thank you, Nancy and Georgie for your response and Sam for your question comment. Um, I have Leon's next in the list. Leons, are you there? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Hey, hey Dozi, Do Do how are you? Uh, greetings from Amherst. I say I'm so well. Hi, Leons. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm all right. Very, Good very to good. see you. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, thanks. Thank you. And thanks, Nancy, for excellent presentations. Um, so I have a question for uh, for Nancy, which draws on the discussion we're just having now from uh, Sam's question. Um, realistically, how do you see the crisis the crisis being an opportunity to add to moving the needle towards uh, policies that address issues of uh, of uh, care, child care, uh, maternity leave? pro-parent, pro-family pro uh, policies in the US? Or is it going to pass like another crisis? In, in, in other words, where is the, what is the, the support for change uh, in the public? Because we see policies which, which, which pass easily. If you want to give, to give cash to, to corporations, you can, uh, the, the policy passes easily, tax cuts for, for, for yeah. the elite. But it's very hard to see. I'm asking, where do you see the space for passing social policies that benefit the majority of the pop of the people? I have. Uh, I always think about uh, what our dear departed uh, Tandika Mukandawira said once, talking about uh, pro poor policies. He said, pro poor policies are all always poorly funded, because they are always poorly supported. So, do you think there is support for 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 care policies uh, in in the U.S., uh, if not support, I don't see I don't see any more. I, I don't know how how how, how to see movement. Uh, question to Dozi: um, the the opposition to social policies has always been a fiscal argument that the governments don't have cannot afford it. Uh, that it will be too expensive. It will throw away the, the fiscal deficit, and there is no 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 policy space for governments to do that. Or do you think that it's actually an ideological issue? Because in the US, we see that the US has no, no, no budget constraint. They can print money the way they want. But they are, they, uh, they, it's easy to, again, give money to the corporations, but it's harder to give money to pre-K pre education, for example, or, or, or childcare. So where do you see the policy, um, in the policy ideolo from an ideological perspective in Africa, the support for social policy, so social protection policies. Thank you. <coughs> Who would like to go first? Either way is fine. Yeah. Okay, I'll take it. Um, uh, Leonce, um, I think the figures I gave on the gender gap are really strong evidence of a potential realignment. And I think, uh, what, I think what we're seeing is a possibility for feminism to turn away or, or feminist mobilization 
to turn away from a, a kind of individualist um, equal rights agenda towards um, a greater recognition that social provision is really key to achieving gender equality, that there has to be some greater collective responsibility for the tasks that have traditionally been, been placed on women in order for uh, women to achieve uh, more egalitarian relationships and fully take advantage of their opportunities. So uh, that's why I think feminism is really a key part of, or, and changing the, you know, re-inflecting, you know, feminism or re-channeling feminism towards more, uh, more social um, uh, goals is, is, is really key. Uh, and I think, you know, whether, what we could argue about whether that is feasible or not, I guess we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But I think that's, that's where my hope, you know, that's where my, what my specific uh, kind of um, vision of a path to change uh, lies is right there. Thank you, Nancy. Jackie, would you like to? Yes. On? Thank you very much, uh, Leons, for, for, for that, that question. <clears throat> I think the opposition to social uh, policy in Africa is, is, is both, both a, a fiscal argument, but also an ideological one. <clears throat> I think it's a fiscal argument in the sense that many of our countries are aid dependent. So um, people who depend on aid do not have the, the, the policy space and will uh, basically do what um, they, 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 they are allowed to do. And that's where the ideological <clears throat> arguments uh, come in. I think we've grown a new, a whole generation of economists and, and development experts who um, truly believe in, in the idea that the market will solve um, all the, 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 the social deficits and, and, and so on. Um, they've, they've never looked at the care economy in the way in which um, heterodox economists uh, look, look at it. I think one of the biggest agendas we, we should have um, as, as uh, developing countries is to begin to grow a new generation of economists and, and, and technocrats, one. Um, but, but also, um, most importantly, to begin to rethink the way we see the relationship between economic and social policies, because different people are, are focusing on, 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 on different aspects of, of development policy. So many economists do not know anything about social policies and the ways in which they can be used to grow economies. And, and many social uh, development experts do not um, pay enough attention to the ways in which certain social development policies can actually, uh, can, can actually grow uh, economies. So that, 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 that gap has, has to be bridged one, one way um, or, or the other. Because there's enough knowledge about these matters these days, and I think until um, we, we 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 are able to um, have this this new generation of of um, of, of of economists and and development actors who think differently and and who also ask different questions, we we will begin to be we will continue to be stuck in in in. Uh, in, in this neoliberal trap, because the, 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 the world is changing and new problems come up every day. And yet old solutions, which haven't worked for a long time, continue uh, to, 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 to be the preferred, um, the, the preferred uh, solutions. And we also need to start from where our economies are. I keep on asking the question, what kinds of social policies do we need for an economy in which the majority are self-employed? And, and live from hand to mouth. Surely it cannot be the, the, the social policies that we copy from, from, um, from, from the global north. It, it, it has to be social policies that speak to the particular problems that, that we have. Thank you so much, Leons, for your question, and Nancy and Georgie for your answers. Um, Nancy Kajingwe is next. And Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, okay, um, I, was, I was kind of respect, thanks to the presenters. I wanted to respond a little bit to the point Jayati was making 
about like why is um, why why are these points not getting traction, even in a point where we've been in a pandemic, um, and we can see the importance of care work, um, and I'll put it as a question, even though it's a bit of a, a statement. <laughs> to I, I, there, there's a problem about um, is isn't there a problem about what we consider to be the economy and what the real economy is. And when people talk about the economy and production and GDP and how they consider care work as not actually being an economical good, even, even as it's a social good and not necessarily a profit-making good, and isn't part of the issue that we need to do around care to understand that one, it's labor, so we're still in a struggle between is it capital that matters or labor that matters? in terms of the economy. And then whose labor matters, not just paid labor, but also unpaid labor. Um, and, and sort of like trying to think about how we change what we understand to be the economy or reframe the, if, if the economy is going to be the basis of how we, of how we shape policy, if, 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 then we have to talk about the economy being something different um, from what we talk about it, uh, from the way we talk about it now. So I'm just wondering whether we, we don't need to have a sort of coming together of um, economic, try, trying to, to, to change how we understand economic policy since that's been the do dominant framework and, uh, and, and what goes into an economy. And I, I, I just always kind of think somehow we don't understand what an economy is at the end of the day, what a market is, what builds it, and therefore care keeps getting excluded. One, because of course it's feminized, um, uh, but it's also, um, I don't wanna say non-marketized, but it's not included into accounting. And that may be one of the things we need to do in order to basically flip the narrative for it to matter on in public policy. That, that's the end of my question slash comment. Thank you. Um, the other Nancy or Georgie, would you like to respond? Not really. I, I agree with what Nancy said, that definitely it involves rethinking what the economy is and, and what matters. If, if um, we, to be able to change the, the current situation. Yeah, agreed. Well said, both of you. Yes, totally. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for articulating this point again so clearly. Thank you. Um, let's move on to Gregor then. Yeah, hi. Thank you for these very interesting and thought-provoking talks. Uh, when I listened to you, I couldn't help but noticing several ostensible parallels between the problem of um, supporting care to, to, to fight COVID <laughs> and the problem to support measures to fight the ecological crisis. And I can give you uh, three examples. You know, one is Oh, we all know we need to support care, but somehow nothing is happening. You said that in the presentation. You know, the same is often said about um, um, thwarting the environmental crisis. Um, you know, scientists say you have to do this and this and that, but then um, a lot of people in power will say, no, we can't because we cannot hurt the economy, uh, even though it's not really clear that not responding to the COVID crisis in the long term, maybe after a few weeks, <laughs> will not hurt the economy even harder and people's livelihood. And of course, in non-high income countries, um, the suffering is, will, uh, I mean, is already, but also in terms of the ecological crisis is and will be the worst, but somehow it seems completely impossible to muster any sort of international cooperation to have international resource transfers. So, um, you know, with the ecological crisis, it seems that whenever the response seems to be profitable, 
then suddenly everybody is on board. And we see that now with the supply of low carbon energy. Um, and I was wondering, you know, do we have to hope for profitable care for that to also happen with COVID-19, slightly provocatively, but more generally, uh, what are the lessons um, that perhaps the care sector in the COVID crisis and the uh, health crisis more generally um, can teach for um, the ecological crisis more generally or vice versa? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Nancy or Jochi, would you like to respond? Yes, indeed. That, that's a very interesting uh, parallel that you've, you've, you've drawn and, and I couldn't uh, agree more. I like your provocation about the idea of profitable care, but actually <laughs> care is very profitable when, when it's, um, it's formalized and privatized. Um, some of the um, some of the uh, richest um, companies in the world are actually involved in, 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 in care. Um, if you take the uh, privatization of, of the NHS in the UK, for example, or even the privatization of, of prisons and so on, these are all very profitable <laughs> ways in, 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 in very, 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 very important ways in which care can be very profitable. I think that the trouble has to do with um, the fact that much of care is hidden and it's and it and it's been done from with, with, within the home. In the in the um, old socialist countries, there was this idea of doing less and less care work at home and doing a lot more of it outside the home and socializing it. And it, it was considered a very interesting idea. And it heralded a period where a lot of women left the home and became uh, be, uh, be, became uh, workers. I think we probably need to return to some of those um, conversations about how to make care more visible and to, to um, remove that burden uh, within the household. Because what COVID has done now is to even add to it. The spectacle of um, mothers who have not spent much time in school having to teach um, their children above classes where they themselves have ha and, and never reached is, is, is quite terrifying. And I think we really have to think of the ways in which we can socialize care for um, a, a more just world. Thank you. Nancy, would you also like to respond? Well, I, I, I'll second what Judgey said, but I, let me add a couple of things. Um, I, I think, um, Gregor, you're, you're absolutely right. We need to think more about the parallels. I think kind of corporate feminism, uh, you know, let's just get women more on, on boards. Uh, you know, let's provide uh, family leaves and nursing spaces for, for uh, highly paid executives. That's kind of a counterpart to um, the, you know, high kind of low cost environmentalism or profitable environmentalism. I mean, yes, feminism can also be kind of turned to profitable ends. And also, you know, environmentalists taught us about the term greenwashing, which is pretending to be environmentally responsible and putting money into public relations when you're not. And, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the last few months, there's been a huge amount of care washing, you know, companies with ads saying, we care for you, we, we love you, we, we want you to be well, we want to protect you. <laughs> so uh, maybe that's an area where we can, we can also be kind of, um, you know, uh, try to insert a little skepticism about these, these claims into the environment. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gregor, for your question, and Nancy and Georgie for your re responses. I have Jul Unal next. Jul, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Gül. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, thank you, Nancy and Jyoti. And it's so nice to see all the familiar faces. I'm so happy to be listening to you from Geneva, Switzerland. So I have a question prompted by Sam's um, you know, optimism, which is, I mean, I had the same optimism and I still am also optimistic like Sam, but I also wanted to ask, have, you know, we, I had the same optimism after 2008, 2009 crisis where we all thought capitalism has come to an end and you know, this is the end of the, the dominant system, but it hasn't. Actually, thing had, things have gotten worse. We're now living in a more unequal society. 
which is much more insecure, lots of you know, unemployment crisis and on top of everything, environmental crisis. So I wonder, have we as both heterodox economists and feminist economists uh, took um, stuck of where we failed last time and what can we do differently or what may be the opportunities that didn't exist last time um, that you know we can now really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nancy or Jati, would you like to respond? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Josie. That's a really tough one. <laughs> but thank you for, for, for raising it. Because it, it's a question that has uh, been, been that, that has been beaten around in my mind for, for a very long time. Because it's almost like the conditions are right to finally say this thing doesn't work. We, we have to move, move in a different direction. And yet it doesn't appear to be that um, there's enough organization and pressure from the ground to, to, to make this change. I don't think this battle will be won simply in the intellectual sphere of better analysis and so on. I think it will be won organizationally and in terms of the kinds of alliances that intellectuals make with, with um, unions, organizations of the working people and so on, and, and environmentalists, um, feminists, all the people who are on the right side of history until we link um, our, our, our struggles and our demands. I think they, they will continue to be fragmented and, and very uh, easy to, 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 to hijack. So that's, that's my short answer. I, I, I'm sure it's not satisfactory to you, but I think this is a question that all of us worry about all the time, that how will, will things change this time round? And, and it, it's, it's, it, it's not completely clear cut. Thank you. Nancy, would you like to follow up? Well, uh, oh, it's so hard. It is really hard to think and talk about this, but I, I don't think we should, <clears throat> Uh, I don't think we should blame ourselves uh, really for the sorry state of the world. Um, I think we just need to be resolved to do the right thing, whatever the consequences will be, and to recognize that it's a really, you know, <laughs> that what we're talking about and what we're reaching for uh, just requires a tremendous amount of persistence and and uh, and just keeping after it. I, I don't know. I don't know what other prescription to give, uh, except that uh, we're we're in here. We're all in, in this for the long haul. Thank you, Joe, for this important question, and Nancy and Jotty for your answers. I have four more people in the stack. Next is Sejuti Das Gupta. Um, hi. Um, that was, yeah, a very intriguing presentation from both of you. But you know, I am new to US. I'm from India. And I have noticed, um, and you know, it's really my concern. Um, I have noticed that a lot of people who work in feminism in the United States don't talk about capitalism at all. You know, they go through entire course materials without ever thinking about the, the, all the issues that you have raised. Um, and, you know, that's where really my concern comes from that while there is, um, you know, this, this very close connection between work, paid work, informal work, uh, where feminism meets um, capitalism and its study, how are we going to create a robust enough movement to change things where among feminists itself, there is such a, you know, such a disagreement about what is the main task on our hands and what is it that we are trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nancy or Jochi, would you like to respond? Well, I, I think capitalism, understanding capitalist institutions and capitalist structures of power is really central to what we're talking about. And um, in, in a way, it's difficult to single them out because we're so surrounded by them. We're so, you know, we're so immersed in them. Um, 
you know, I, I guess I, I do come from a kind of a traditional political economy that really emphasizes the importance of class, class differences. But I think my, you know, my basic kind of perspective on this that I, I lay out in my um, forthcoming book is that we really need to see the way, look at the way that class and gender and race, ethnicity and citizenship uh, interact and uh, that to build coalitions, uh, to build the kind of coalitions that we need to affect change, uh, we can't just invoke class. Um, so I, I have a slightly, uh, you know, complicated relationship to the Marxian tradition, but I am certainly uh, really convinced of its relevance to understanding collective conflict and also the central importance of class, class difference in class. Um, class dynamics. I don't know if that, I hope that helps. It's a big, it's a big topic uh, and an important one. Thank you, Nancy. Jachi, would you like to respond? Um, not really. I, I, I want to agree with Nancy that this, this uh, class is, a, is an important issue and, and many heterodox feminists, I think, know, know and understand this. And the whole notion of intersectionality is an, a, an example of analysis which tries to um, account for the intersections of class and race and, 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 and gender and, um, and, and many other um, sorts of inequalities. So um, it is an important issue, not only in terms of analysis, but also in terms of the alliances we make and the, and the struggles we wage and the demands um, in, 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 in that struggle. So, so thank you for drawing attention to this issue. Thanks to the three of you. Um, Laura, Melissa, and Arancho is next. Uh, yes, uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this amazing conversation. Uh, well, I will start with uh, my context that is Colombia. Um, before pandemic, um, many middle class women outsource um, other women for taking care uh, of their children. But nowadays with the pandemic, uh, the situation uh, have changed. Uh, these women can continue employ other women and then they, they have to take care of their own children. Uh, so the question uh, is, there, uh, is there a loosening of marketization of care work? And it, it is, if it is uh, affirmative, then how, uh, can, uh, how we can um, counteract uh, this the, the question? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nancy or Joshi, would you like to respond? The question whether there's a multiplication of care work, is, is that what she said? I heard the earlier part about middle class women who used to use domestic workers now having to take care of their own children. But she asked a question that I missed. Is Would you like to ask a question in just one sentence, please? Your last, your last point. Were you asking about the multiplication of, of domestic work? And no, it is more like uh, it is losing the marketization. Uh, oh, okay. okay, 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 okay. I heard you now. Okay, yeah. Why don't you go, Josie? <laughs> okay, okay. So, 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 um, the the this the the the, the paid domestic um, work sector is is um, in a certain sense a, a very uh, complicated issue for 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 feminist analysis because um, it's middle it, it raises issues about class and gender the intersections of, of class and gender in in, in, in in our politics so middle class women use um, uh, domestic workers to 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 free themselves to do their work outside the house and there have been many challenges about the conditions of domestic workers. In, 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 in many countries in Africa, with the exception of South Africa and, and, and perhaps Kenya, um, domestic work is highly unregulated and, 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 and problematic. And yet it is the refuge of a lot of, um, a lot of middle class women. So certainly a situation where middle class women have lost this, um, 
this 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 facility might be seen as as problematic at the same time it raises a question about how to refashion um, uh, the whole domestic work sector so that it becomes more formalized and 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 and, and more regulated to ensure that the people who also do this work and earn a living wage while they take care of, of the children of middle-class women and so on. And I think this would be very good for, for, for the women's movement. So it, it could be an opportunity to, to change the way uh, domestic work is, um, is, 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 is organized. But you are right when you make the point that what it has done is that it has reduced the marketization of um, of, of care work in, 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 in the way in which it has manifested itself at this time. Thank you. Nancy, would you like to respond? Well, I think there's an interesting parallel with the US where um, low wage migrant workers, women, uh, made it easier for highly educated women in, in coastal cities in particular to offload their care responsibilities. And one of the interesting things that's happening now is that, that um, as that flow has been cut off, I think that increases the pressures for those women to push for more public uh, provision. Thank you. Um, I have two more people in the stack, Abita and Lisa Saunders. Abita, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I'll go for it. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Dodsi, uh, for those very interesting and thought-provoking presentations. So um, in this pandemic, we have been seeing news about heightened um, incidents of domestic violence from all across. And we are also seeing increasing or worsening of care burden. Um, so I'm just trying to like, understand if these two dynamics are related. If it's a, if it is the case that you know increasing care burden brings about certain kind of bargaining or negotiations among uh, spouses within the household who are now stuck with each other. The exposure to each other is like you know far greater than how it was earlier. So, um, uh, especially in the context where in the global south we are facing a crisis of social reproduction, is it that this worsening of care burden is what is leading to this, um, you know, uh, much worsened incidents of domestic violence, um, does that make sense? I mean, or is it more about the financial insecurities faced by households and you know greater exposure? Um, yeah, that's my question, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nancy or Dottie, would you like to respond? Okay, I, I, I don't think there's one reason for the increase in, in domestic uh, violence. Definitely the crisis of social reproduction is, 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 is a central concern. And with all the fear and insecurity and so on, the, the propensity for tensions within the, the, the household um, are, are very high. But it is also linked with um, the fact that people are actually stuck at home physically. They are spending much more time at home than uh, um, in many homes were, were, were built for. It's a point I made in my presentation that many homes are built as uh, dormitories where people sleep, but spend time away from each other outside the house. Now they are stuck in that tiny space and so on. So if there's already domestic violence, it's likely um, uh, to, 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 to increase. And I imagine that the increased care burden will also be a factor. So, so I think that all of, all of these are responsible uh, for, for, for the observed increase in, in, in domestic violence in, in, in certain situations. Thank you. Nancy, would you like to respond? Just, you know, also a lot of evidence of really serious mental health stress related mental health problems, I think really yeah. is also part of what's going on. Yeah. Isabella, you are muted. Okay, now you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry for that. So we have uh, one last question by Lisa Saunders. Um, and, but if you still have a question, 
feel free to post in the chat. And Nancy and Georgie have kindly agreed to um, post their answers to your questions in the chat. And I will share that um, together with the video after the event. Um, so we'll move to Lisa. Lisa, are you there? Hi, I'm here. I, I'm responding to Gregor who asked a question related to corporatization of care. And I wanted to share um, some information I got from an Institute for Women's Policy Research study that corporations are becoming cognizant of how much they lose when women leave work to take care of a sick relative or a child uh, when they don't have, when they hadn't in the past had any kind of paid parental leave. There are a handful of states, in fact, where research has been done to document the cost to corporations and to the state are significant with regard to the corporations. It's typically the cost of replacement and training qualified uh, women. With respect to the state, it's the um, children's medical care and the unemployment insurance the states are paying. So there's just a handful of states and Massachusetts, one of the most recent to do this, have, have used that kind of information to um, design socialized ways. In some cases, the corporates, corporations pay into it. In some cases, as in California and Massachusetts, it's workers who are paying into um, kind of socialized medical and family leave for workers. That's all I had to say. Thank you. I'm sorry I was late, but I just couldn't get in. All the tickets were sold or so it said. So thanks, thanks for getting me into you're the last part of this. Sorry for that, Lisa. I'm sorry. Um, Nancy or Jati, would you like to respond? No, just to thank her for, for, for that information. It's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, um, then it's up to me to thank everybody for your great questions and comments, not only via video, but also in the chat. And thanks so much to Nancy and Jati for joining us. Uh, tonight or this afternoon. Um, I think this has been an incredibly rich um, discussion that certainly has changed my view on the care and crisis and the centrality of care and gender. So thank you so much. Let me also um, invite you to the next political economy workshop, which is coming up on the 10th of November um, from 7.30 to 9 p.m. with Professor Zhou Jiyuan from Tsinghua University, who will address the question what does the COVID-19 crisis tell us about China? So November 10th, 7.30 p.m. I have posted the link to the next event um, in the chat box. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, Nancy and Georgie have agreed to still hang on for a few minutes. So in case you still have questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, but I will stop recording now. And thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella.